Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm John Rizzio Hamilton. I'm a member of the Federal Bar Council's Programming Committee, and I'm a partner at Bernstein, Litowitz, Berger, and Grossman in New York. On behalf of Jonathan M. Moses, president of the Federal Bar Council, I welcome you all to our program, Life of a Federal Law Clerk. Um, let me just give you a brief word about the Federal Bar Council before we begin. The Federal Bar Council provides lawyers with a unique opportunity to meet with judges in professional and social settings, to exchange views, and to perform services for the courts of the Second Circuit and the legal community. From its inception in 1932, the Federal Bar Council, with the help of the Federal Bar Foundation, has sought to forge a special bond between judges and attorneys through a wide variety of programs and events, including tonight's webinar. Um, with that said, I'd like to turn to our esteemed panel and briefly introduce them to you. We have uh, several uh, former federal law clerks at all different levels um, of the judiciary, uh, magistrate judges, district court judges, uh, appellate court judges who are, are joining us this evening to give us their insight. And um, we're very grateful for that and excited to have them here. Um, Joshua Busson um, worked at Skadden as an associate for two years after law school. He then clerked for Judge John Codel on the Southern District of New York and for Judge Joseph Bianco on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. He's currently an associate at Morvillo, Abramowitz, Grand, Ison, and Anello, where he focuses on white collar criminal matters. Um, Kieran Rosenkild is an associate in the litigation department at Hughes, Hubbard, and Reed, primarily working on white collar defense matters. Kieran clerked for Magistrate Judge Sarah Cave of the Southern District of New York from 2020 to 2022. Kieran began his career as an assistant district attorney at the Bronx District Attorney's Office, and then served as an assistant corporation counsel and senior counsel at the New York City Law Department. Uh, Nico Gurian is an associate at Getnick and Getnick, where he is actively involved in the firm's whistleblower, anti-fraud litigation, and business integrity practices. He's a graduate of Columbia, and he clerked for Judge Nicholas Garifas on the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York. Nicole Santoro clerked for the Honorable Andrew P. Gordon in the District Court for the District of Nevada in Las Vegas. And she currently works on securities class action cases at Bernstein, Litowitz, Berger, and Grossman. Joseph Stern is an associate at Morvillo uh, Abramowitz, Grand, Ison, and Anello, where he also focuses on white collar criminal defense, investigations, and general commercial litigation. He clerked in 2018 and 2019 for Judge Sidney Stein in the Southern District of New York. After working for four years as an associate at Cleary Gottlieb, um, Joe is also a member of the First Decade Committee of the Federal Bar Council and the New York City Affairs and Government Ethics Committee at the New York City Bar Association. Uh, also joining us is uh, Daniel Fishbein. Um, Daniel clerked for um, Judge Teresa Springman in the Northern District of Indiana, as well as uh, Judge Irizarry in the Eastern District of New York. Um, and he's currently an associate at Struke, Struke and Levan, where he uh, concentrates his practice on white collar matters. Um, thank you all very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you all here, and we're very thankful for it. Um, I also clerked. I, I clerked for Judge Stein, like Joe did, uh, in the Southern District of New York, and then I clerked for Judge Chester Straub on the Second Circuit uh, before joining the firm that I'm currently at now. And it was some of the greatest experience of my legal career. Um, I, when I graduated law school, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, except that I knew I wanted to clerk. And so I was very fortunate to clerk for two great judges and two great people. And I, and it was formative for me as a lawyer. Um, and the purpose of the program today is to give all of our audience members some insight into being a clerk, um, including how to set yourself up to get the job how to prepare for the job, what you can expect when you get there, um, what you're going to experience and what you need to be ready to do, and what the benefits and challenges of it are. 
Um, and I hope that everyone who's interested in having the experience gets to have it because it is it is a wonderful thing. Um, so let me begin kind of at the beginning. There's many topics to cover, but I think one thing that's often on people's mind is, is it better to clerk straight out of law school? Is it better to have some work experience? And there's really no right answer. I happen to clerk straight out of law school, but many of my co-clerks uh, had big firm experience. And, and I think that there, there are benefits to both. Um, and so I'd sort of like to, to start with that topic and maybe, Kieran, you can kick us off. You know, you practiced in the government for about seven years before clerking. And I'd be curious to hear um, what your experience was like and, and if you think that was a benefit to you. And then I'd also like to hear from, you know, people like Joshua who, who worked for a couple of years at a firm and, and, and Nicole who, who clerked out of law school to get all the perspectives on this. So Kieran, why don't, why don't you begin? Sure, thanks so much, John. Um, so I guess just really briefly, when I graduated law school, I never expected that I would be pursuing a clerkship. I single-mindedly wanted to be a, an assistant district attorney and to do trials. Um, and it was really kind of a later in my career development that I got interested in it. Um, and I think for me, having some work experience was just so valuable in terms of my clerkship application process and also just in terms of my job as a clerk and being able to help out with my judge. Um, my work experience, I think it gave me perspective on how to litigate. Um, after the DA's office, I was at the law department, so I was in federal court a fair amount. Uh, you know, writing letter motions and getting in discovery disputes and taking depositions and doing all the things that uh, litigants do. And I think that kind of gave me the perspective on being able to see litigation from beginning to end. Um, and also just the skill development of being able to write a lot, understanding what judges are looking for in writing. Um, and clerking, ultimately, you're trying to help a judge, you're trying to have, you know, to arm your judge with information so they can make the correct decisions. And so doing all of those things kind of gave me all of the skills that I think were really helpful and served me well in the clerkship process. Um, you know, I, before I go to uh, uh, Joshua and Nicole and Joseph, you, you were also at Cleary, you know, before you clerked for Judge Stein, to hear their perspectives. I just had such a different experience because I joined Judge Stein's chambers straight out of law school. And I remember the first day of substantive work, I had no idea what a reply brief even was. Like I had literally never seen a reply brief. And it is without question the most important brief in the briefing cycle. And so I had just read through the, the opening brief in the opposition and I thought I'd form my opinion to make a recommendation to him. And then I was told that, you know, there's also the reply brief in the file and I like read the reply brief and it totally changed my perspective on everything. Um, so I could see how having some experience would help. Um, and Joshua and Nicole or Joseph or anyone really, you know, what are your perspectives on this and what was your experience like from your different backgrounds? Yeah, so I worked uh, two years at Skadden before I started my clerkship and the obvious pros are you're not coming in completely green. You've done some writing, um, you've developed some of the uh, skills that you need to, to be a good clerk and generally a, more of a familiarity with uh, the things they don't teach you in law school with the way the, the courts operate. Um, I think as far as uh, it goes, everyone catches up pretty quick. Even if you're starting out of law school within a, a month or two that advantage kind of disappears. And I think there are some sincere advantages to your career to starting right out of law school. You finish as a clerk within one or two years, and you have that same training that everyone else has, um, although we spent more time at a firm. Uh, I think at, you know, big law firms, you learn how to do things very, very precisely. Uh, you spend a lot of time making sure every um, I is dotted, T is crossed. And uh, I think the thing that I uh, needed to pick up on when I started because of that training was how to move also very efficiently because there are, uh, especially on the district court, a lot of orders to push out and research and writing to do. So 
I, I think it's definitely a balance. Uh, I don't think there's a wrong answer when it comes to when you should do it. I think there are pros and cons for both sides. Yeah, I mean, certainly there's financial concerns too. Um, some people just, you know, need to work for a while. Um, but there there were benefits to me. I, I shouldn't make it just as if, you know, I came in like a, you know, like a dummy and there was no benefit. There was. Like I got to, as a first year lawyer, I got to do really substantive work right away. Yeah. And I got to play an important role in the decision making process. Um, also, applying out of school, I, I had like the benefit of a of a school application machine to help me with the process of applying and professors who were there to kind of like give me recommendations and the like. So those, I guess, were some advantages. Nicole, what was your experience like? Yeah, I definitely agree there's no wrong answer. Um, the whole school application machine was very helpful. Um, I was able to apply just very efficiently, more than I would on my own. And for me, I just, it logistically worked better for me to clerk right away after law school. Um, I knew that I wasn't going to go to a big firm, so I didn't want to have it up in the air, like what my plans were and where I would be. And also, I knew I identified that I wanted to clerk in the District of Nevada because I'm from there, and I know there are some really wonderful judges there. And um, I knew that I would be able, they don't hire years out in advance, like some other courts do like maybe SDNY. So um, it just worked logistically. And um, one other big advantage uh, I found from going straight out was that uh, I had so many concepts fresh on my mind from law school, like, like a, I don't know, issue preclusion, all these things, all these yeah. civil procedure things that um, when you're clerking, a, a, a cool thing is that you just get so many issues thrown at you. And so it was nice to have them so all pretty fresh in my mind. Yeah. Any other observations from people on the panel about this? I, um, my first clerkship in the Northern District of Indiana, I um, was kind of the pivot. I was a corporate attorney and I really wanted to do litigation. And, you know, where I went to law school is kind of a geographic feeder in a way. And uh, I was able to, uh, you know, get that clerkship. And, um, I guess not only pivot uh, in what uh, geographically where I was as practicing practicing in Chicago, I was able to then go back to New York at that point too. Um, so uh, it was it was a great um, opportunity at that point. That's a really interesting point because I've I've seen other lawyers do that, lawyers who are on the corporate side of the house at their firms who wanted to pivot to litigation. And it's harder for them to get a litigation job as a corporate, you know, transactional deal attorney. But sometimes they're able to get a clerkship. And then from there, that makes the pivot much easier. It's like a, a platform that they can make that change from. So that's really interesting. Um, um, Joseph, you're a, uh, you think Cleary, spending your time at Cleary was an advantage coming in? Yeah, absolutely. Too. I mean, my experience was having one year at the, at the big firm at Cleary before um, before going to start the clerkship. Um, and at the risk of repeating some of the themes that have been said already, I mean, I, I thought that was a great balance um, because you want to get that clerkship experience you know, early on. It has such advantages for your you know future career as a litigator, which I'm sure we'll get to later on in the panel. Mm -hmm. um, and so getting that experience early on is important, but there is something to be said about how law school doesn't prepare you for any of the practical stuff about litigation, J just basics like the pattern of a case, such as, you know, briefs are, there's a brief, an opposition, a reply, like John was saying, or or just, just you see a complaint, you know, a motion to dismiss is coming. Once that happens, then there's discovery in those motions. And then after that, there's summary judgment. And after that, there's pretrial. And then there's jury instructions. All those things, you, you really don't think that way. Um, and so getting a little bit of exposure to practice first um, was very helpful. So um, I recommend doing one year exactly and then studying the collection. <laughs> exactly what I did. <laughs> the, last, the last point I'll make on the other side of the ledger for you know, doing it out of law school is if you're not 100% sure what you want to do it's, and, and you can get a clerkship 
uh, and you know you do want to spend at least some time clerking, uh, but you're not sure what you want to do longer term, it's a really good way to figure it out because you get exposure to lots of different fields of law, lots of different lawyers, um, and it's all kind of grist for the mill as you're figuring out what you might have an interest in longer term. Um, so when you when you're applying straight out of law school, you know, it's pretty easy in terms of recommendations. They come from your professors and often your professors know judges have relationships with them. And so those recommendations can carry weight. But if you're coming out of a job, um, particularly if you've worked for more than one year, do your recommendations come from your bosses? Is that is that how that works? I had one letter from uh, a partner that I worked with at SCAD, which is a little uncomfortable. Right. Um, it, with professors, it's understood, and they they love to write letters and do this. With your boss, you're essentially saying, "I would like to leave, but I'll stay unless it doesn't work out." Um, and so uh, it's it's slightly more uncomfortable to do that after you've started. I had a great boss who didn't take it personally and was willing to write a nice letter. Uh, but it's it is one consideration, and I think something that if you're applying after law school, the judge will probably expect. I think it would look a little odd if you didn't include something from your your current employer. Right. Right. And Kieran, for for you, was it letters of I, I imagine you you had been working in it for a while, so. I had, um, I still had one professor provide one though, because I thought it was really important. The advice that I was given was that ultimately uh, the letters need to show rigor in your ability to write. And, you know, whether you can do trials or, or whatever the kind of thing you do in practice, if it doesn't ultimately go to your writing and researching ability, it's of less utility. Uh, so I had one from someone I worked with, uh, a boss, and then one from a professor, which I think was a good balance. For me. Okay. Yeah, um, just, if I could just add, this is, you know, probably said a lot at clerkship panels, but worth saying again, like pulling pulling the veil back a little bit. All these judges are, are people and are friends with professors. And so um, even if you're applying from a job, I, I would highly recommend going back to your law school professors, asking them to, to reach out because there are so many great applicants. I mean, speaking for myself, there's a particular Columbia professor who had a good relationship with my judge and, you know, it, it could have had all the letters or journal articles or whatever, but it really was that phone call that got me, you know, inside the door. So I would just keep that in, keep that in mind as you're applying. That's a great point. That's a great point. I should um, say, oh, 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 I had kind of the inverse of Josh's experience where I had a very supportive partner in the litigation group who I was actually doing a pro bono matter with um, and approached me and said, hey, Dan, like you like doing litigation so much. Why don't you clerk? I'll write you a rec. And that actually happened to be while well, I was being um, wandered down to go into the prison with her to meet the client. Um, so, you know, it was that, that second of like, oh, like, do I out myself or not? And I was like, yeah, that's like kind of what I want to do. And <laughs> I was very thankful that she did. And I had, you know, law school professors besides that. Uh, and, um, you know, in my law school apparatus overall, you know, very good and very important uh, in the application process, even having that work experience uh, implying, you know, you're out of school. Right. Um let me just kind of lift the veil a little bit for some of the people who are in the audience and describe what the typical process was like in my chambers of um, going through resumes. You know, we would get a ton of resumes and the clerks would be the first screeners and they would kind of set aside a subset of the resumes that looked the most promising because they're all good. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, it's not easy. Um, and we put aside a, a subset that looked really good. Um, uh, and then uh, we'd invite those folks in for interviews and um, they would interview with the clerks and then the judge. Uh, and I'm curious to hear your all experience in this. Did 
the process that that you participated in work similarly? Do you have any tips uh, about how to navigate this process for people who are going to go through it? That was very similar to how we did it. The, the resumes would come in. We had a um, different clerks in chambers had different responsibilities. I was the clerkship guy, so I had a box under my desk that the resume, the applications would go in and then we'd periodically go through them when the judge told us to. Um, and we'd pull out ones that uh, we thought looked good or that he would like. Um, and then, you know, there are people that the judge knows, other judges, colleagues who would reach out to him and that would sort of be another, another path. Um, but I would say, again, the sort of echoing what I said earlier, my, the biggest advice is like there are so many applications, so something needs to happen to, um, you know, make some movement on yours. So any sort of professor calling, former boss calling, anything where it's like literally forcing chambers to pick up and, you know, match the name on the phone to a resume and start looking at it, um, that really will get the ball rolling. Yeah, I, I'd add to what Nico said. Um, I, I totally agree. And I, I worked in the same chambers as John. So we, we, the clerks were the screeners uh, at first. And it was frustrating um, because there were so many good applicants. And it's really whether that resume just kind of clicks with the clerk that happens to be reviewing it at the time that the judge happens to be looking. Um, it's really a, a luck of the draw. And it's frustrating because there's so many great applicants and it's it's a little random as to you know who, who gets picked out of the hat. And so uh, you know, I will say that, you know, definitely what Nico said, to the extent you get some kind of in that you can use that that's, you know, you should use that. And if not, it, it, don't get frustrated, reapply. Um, it, it'll, something will happen eventually, I, I think. Yeah, put yourself out there with a bunch of judges, reapply if you don't hear anything. Um, it can be frustrating, but, but yeah. all right. Yeah, I agree. A, a call is 10X what your application is. I, it's incredible how much uh, weight that carries, particularly if the judge knows the person, but also not, I mean, someone some recommender showing the initiative to call in because they care about this person enough to do it goes a long way um and then we we have the same process so i won't repeat that but another thing is updating your application or resending it can be very helpful because like joe said it kind of depends on when the person is looking at it if it clicks at that time um, and if you update your application, you may get another look from the clerk, um, or there may be a new clerk that likes your interest section and also enjoys hiking. And so you get in that time. Um, so I would, I would update it, uh, at least once a year, if not more often. Any tips on, on the interviews, uh, you know, for the clerks, for the judge, are they both equal weight? Yeah, on interviews, I'd say um, it helps a lot to, if you have any way in advance of talking with someone who has clerked or interviewed with that judge. Um, I mean, I've just generally been told there's kind of two types of clerkship interviews. There are legal question heavy ones and there are ones that are just about fit mainly. Um, and so it, it just helps a lot to know what you're going into. Um, and yeah, I mean, as far as tips, um, aside from that, I think, uh, I mean, advice that I've heard a lot is that, you know, you're basically interviewing with the clerks. I mean, in the, my judges' interviews were like all at once, the clerks and the judge. So, oh, wow. um, yeah, like all of their evaluations matter. You just don't know what will move the needle. I would just echo the point about reaching out to former clerks. I think it's a great idea. Uh, people are often, if not always, willing to speak. It's a great way to really get a sense of the chambers, how the judge operates, how everyone sees their role. And I think it's really invaluable. Um, and I guess just all the advice, I, I mean, 
it, of course, know why you want to work for a particular judge um, and just be genuinely curious. I think that's really helpful because I, I think the opposite of that, if you don't seem curious or if you seem closed minded, that's that's not a good, uh, you know, vibe to give off. Yeah, I have I have one observation that I'll offer and then I'll ask one question. The observation is that you uh, as a clerkship applicant probably will not interview with the judges, staff who aren't clerks, the secretary, the deputy. But it is critical that you remember those people have probably been with that judge for a lot longer than the clerks have. And 10, 15, 20 years, maybe more. And how you treat those people matters. And they can they can take you out with one word to the judge if you're not, you know, sufficiently respectful and kind to them. Um, so please like keep that in mind, you know, those, the, the, the assistant and the deputy have, have probably been with the judge for an incredibly long time and have a really close relationship with the judge. Um, I should say both my clerkships with Judge Springman and Judge Rosari, part of the interview, um, uh, the courtroom deputy was part of, you know, the, the clerk uh, panel that you met with. Oh, wow. Um, that's interesting that's yeah interesting. it's part of you know part of the family and the, what one question i would have is um is it worthwhile to be familiar with the judges like more prominent opinions or does that come across as pandering i i i don't think it i don't think it hurts um to just sort of read up on it and, and know about them, especially because I think you'll be preparing for the interview and sort of realize that you're done preparing and you're not sure really what else to do. And it's sort of a, a good thing to do to give you some peace of mind. Um, situations are different. I really wouldn't recommend going in and, you know, judge, I'm just like such a fan of your jurisprudence and the way that you, you know, handle this, you know, preclusion issue just blew my mind. I mean, that's like, it's, that that's going to get a little bit of a like, come on, response in, in in my view. But others may disagree. No, I agree with. Oh, sorry. No, there you go. I was going to say I agree with Nico. And actually, in terms of preparing for a clerkship, that was the one thing that I did, not to learn the holding of any case, but just to see how the judge wrote. Uh, because, it, it, you know, in a clerkship, you're dealing with so many different subject matters, it, it would be pretty impossible to prepare otherwise. But just seeing how judges write their opinions, like, how do they structure them? Do they use defined terms? How much? How long do they write? How much do they cite? I think those are really helpful things that you can glean from any opinion. So if you just skim a bunch with an eye toward writing them, as opposed to what do they hold, it's pretty valuable. Yeah. So let's say, so let's say now you're fortunate enough to, to get the job. Um, what can we tell our viewers about the initial learning curve? Are there any things that you guys recommend doing in advance of the job to help? You know, one thing I did, and I think it's pretty standard, is that um, you go to chambers for like a, a couple of shadow days where you shadow the clerks. Um, is there anything else that that people can and should do? Should they go to court and watch the judge in action? Is there anything they should read? Should they have um, uh, coffee with their co-clerks? Um, should they ask if there's staggered clerkships? I don't know, Joshua, I think that, uh, uh, did both of your clerkships have staggered? No, with Judge Codal, we all started in the fall. Uh, I mean, we started 15 or 20 days apart. So there was a little bit of staggering so the prior clerks could train you. But uh, for Judge Bianco, we had three in the fall, one in January. Okay, and so people know, you know, a staggered clerkship is where not all the clerks roll over at the same time. Um, and many chambers do it, uh, do stagger their clerkships so that the incoming clerks have the benefit of coming in with at least one clerk that's been there for like six months. Um, so I'm curious to hear, you know, are, are there any things that you guys, would recommend that people do to prep? 
I, I really think that um, I would really advise against trying to do too much to prep. If, if I'm honest, I think that getting a coffee or a drink or whatever with the um, with your clerks or the outgoing clerks is sort of a nice thing to do sort of more socially and collegially than substantively. Um, and my judge did have the uh, shadow shadow days. Um, as well as the September, two September and one January mm -hmm. clerks. Um, but I, I think, you know, if you, if, if the judge hires you to do it, he or she's confident in your ability. And I think you just sort of have to accept there's going to be a learning curve. You're not really going to know what to do at first, but that's why you have co-clerks. That's why you have a courtroom deputy and ultimately that's why you have a judge and so it's a constant learning process you have to bounce questions off each other all the time but i would say the best thing you could do is see how early you can leave your your job and have a nice vacation and rest <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, i mean I, I agree with what nico said because i i remember just starting um, with the clerkship, and my first my first assignment was a summary judgment motion on a trademark issue, and so there was a huge record. It was an area of practice I had never been exposed to in law school or in you know at the law firm, so I was pretty overwhelmed to start. Um, and so I guess I would just say that that's a normal feeling, and you know ex exactly what Nico said that you know the judge is hiring you because he's confident you'll he or she is confident you'll figure it out. Um, which you will. Um, I got comfortable with dealing with areas of practice that I wasn't used to. Um, but there's not really much that prep in advance would have helped uh, you know, unless I decided to practice trademark law for, you know, in advance of the clerkship. Right. Um, so, you know, just, just own the new experiences uh, and just be ready for that. Right. That's good advice. Um, I, you know, I'd be curious to hear from you guys how your chambers work in terms of docket management and assignments. You know, many chambers are structured where if there's three clerks, you know, the sort of last number of every case that they're each assigned a range, you know, whatever it is, zero to two, et cetera. And they get every case that ends with a number that falls in that range. Um, is that how your chambers work? Uh, in terms of how clerks were assigned cases? Mine was a little different. Um, you know, we had the list of cases um, to get to and um, preference was to go through them in order, but um, there was no strict, like, you know, oh, you do this number or something. It was more just um, try to take the first one on the list, but if there's something nearby that, looks really interesting to you that you'd really like to get experience working on, then uh, you could work on that. And that's actually a good thing to ask about in your interviews. Like how does the chambers work? Because it's just good to know in advance. Yeah. Yeah. Did anyone else have a, a similar or different system of assignment in their chambers? We had what you described. It was you know, I was the one, two, three clerk. So any any case that ended in one, two, or three was automatically mine, and then four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so it was just sort of a automatic distribution set up. Right. Um, and then if that sort of randomly resulted in one clerk being like overloaded at any given moment, would you guys rebalance? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we would have, um, uh, I, well, and I guess this dovetails into, you know, the, the 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 uh, C, CJRA list, um, but you know we would we would have a meeting right after each one, um, and we'd go through what's on the six month list. And if somebody was super overloaded, you know there might be some trading going on, balancing that a little, right? Uh, make more even. So let's talk just briefly about the six month list. Um, it's a list of motions that have been pending for six months or more. Um, and it can have a big impact on chambers workflow because some judges don't care 
about it. They could have 20 motions on the six month list and they just don't care. Other judges refuse to have a single motion ever on that list. Um, and so I'd be curious to hear what the approaches were of the different judges that, that you all clerked for and how it impacted Chambers sort of workflow. Um, yeah, why don't you start us off since you, you mentioned it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, for both clerkships, it was, you know, kind of everything. <laughs> um, it, it, in, 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 um, in Indiana, we, we actually dealt as clerks more with the criminal docket as well. But, um, you know, your, uh, um, you know, the civil, like, the, yeah, the six month list, um, you know, was critically important. But we, you know, it was more in Indiana, like, let's do something kind of every week and, and kind of, you know, push it along. And, um, you know, in Judge Rosari, um, you know, is a little bit more more concentrated um, in terms of what, what we were pushing out at any given time. So that, that was a real difference, but it was all contingent on that list and, you know, what was going to happen. Right. Yeah, we had no option. It, everything was going to be cleared off of that list, hopefully well uh, in advance of the September 30 or March 30 deadlines. Um, but yeah, we very, very much cared about getting it done on time. Right. Any other experiences, Nicole? Is that how your motion list was ordered? The one that all the work would come off of? Yeah, that was how it was ordered. Um, it is, yeah, it is always on your mind. Uh, it, it's really nice to have it be cleared off. Um, uh, but my judge is pretty, I mean, most judges are probably pretty type A, I imagine. So he he cared, but um, you want to get through things efficiently. But, you know, it was also fine if you had a few left over. Right. Um, Dan, you touched on something else, which was the criminal versus civil docket. And different judges have very different approaches to this. And it's actually something I think that if people are out there applying for clerkships, they should consider talking to their judges about during the interview process because it makes a big difference. You know, some judges involve their clerks much less in criminal matters and in particular sentencing. Um, and other judges involve them, you know, equally on the criminal and civil sides. Uh, did any of you have differing levels of involvement in the criminal and, and civil side and how did it impact the clerkship? It was the same for you, Joshua, on both sides of the docket? Yeah. Uh, in general, I think that we helped with pretty much everything. Yeah. Even sentencing? Um, I won't get into it too much. Uh, my judge probably doesn't want us to talk too much about that part of the process, but um, we we would be very involved overall with the, the criminal and civil cases. Um, I, I'm forgetting, I think there were some uh, motions that maybe we wouldn't be as involved with, mm -hmm. uh, but generally we worked out on, we worked on everything. Yeah. How about the rest of you? Were there differences in your involvement on the different sides of the docket? I think the biggest difference just for me is that, it, the, you know, in, in the district court criminal case, there's sort of a flow with criminal cases of status conferences, um, sort of other hearings, check, checking in. And so the, the judge and his longtime deputy sort of would be, would would take the lead on sort of handling those more day-to-day -day -day things. Um, but similar to Joshua on sort of the larger motions or, or, or bigger issues are pretty much similar, civil and criminal. Yeah. I guess one thing, oh, sorry. Go. Oh, go ahead. No, no, please. Okay, I was just going to say I um, I really only worked on civil um, just um, case orders, and just every now and then, if obviously if there was a criminal trial, I'd be um, you know helping out with any research and just the whole trial and stuff, but um, largely only civil. 
Yeah, one thing I was going to say, the one thing that was different about my clerkship, uh, so my judge was a magistrate judge, and magistrate judges, it's a little different than district judges. Um, the docket is primarily civil. Magistrates in SDNY do a criminal duty week. I think it's once every 11 weeks. Um, I think it might be different in White Plains, but that's what it is uh, in downtown Manhattan. Um, so primarily, and so during criminal duty week, the judges are doing search warrants, arrest warrants, time sensitive presentments, that kind of thing. Um, so clerks generally handle the civil matters to keep the civil docket afloat. Um, so slightly different there. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it was interesting. On the, on the district court level, we had uh, criminal trials and there was a lot of clerk involvement there because lots of evidentiary issues would arise and there's a lot for clerks to do on the criminal trials. Um, not so much on the sentencing. Um, you know, there were guidelines and it's so much judge discretion and, uh, and judges take that so seriously that, um, and rightly so, that there's less involvement on that part piece of it for sure. But then at, uh, at the appellate level, when you're reviewing sentencing determinations, you do get more involved as a clerk in those issues because there's, you know, there's a body of appellate law that kind of guides you. Um, and so those, those were differences in involvement uh, on the criminal side, uh, in my experience, based on the, the different um, types of clerkships. Uh, and people should keep it in mind. And, you know, some judges have, do have strong feelings about it. And so, you know, it's worth, I think, asking during the interview process, just so you get a sense of what your work's going to be like. Um, let's talk about the heart of the job, um, which is really fascinating. Uh, you know, some of it could involve bench memos, some just formal opinions and no memos. Um, and Joshua, I'd like to kind of start with you because you have the experience of a district court clerkship and an appellate clerkship. And I'm, uh, I'm hopeful that you can kind of walk us through the, the principal differences um, and what kind of a day in the life is, is like for an appellate clerk versus a district court clerk. Yeah, sure. Um, so some of the major differences is the amount of work product you have to push out as a district court clerk many more cases, many more orders. Um, and so there's just a lot more that you're doing. On the appellate court, uh, you get your slate of cases for a given sitting, which is when you're going to hear oral argument. And each clerk uh, gets assigned a set of cases. There are four clerks at the appellate level. Um, and so it's a lot slower paced. Uh, there's a much larger reliance on bench memos. We very rarely did a bench memo in district court. Uh, if Maybe if there was a tough issue during trial, I could see you writing a bench memo to your judge. But otherwise, you're mostly working on opinions and orders and trying to get those out in the district court. In the appellate court, when you get your briefs for your cases, you read the papers and you write a memo to your judge advising uh, him or her what you think they should do and point out the good arguments, the bad arguments, and uh, make a recommendation. And you don't write the opinion generally then because you don't know who it's going to be assigned to. Uh, there are also things called summary orders where if you know you're presiding over the panel, you might be helping to write those beforehand. But in general, there's a lot more reliance on bench memos. And at the appellate level, um, the judges come to the argument armed with these bench memos. And so each, each member of the panel has them. And then the argument occurs. And then after the argument, um, typically the judges conference will, where they will discuss the case and kind of um, express their views. And is there ever, do they ever exchange memos after that conference if they have differing views? Like, is there a back and forth communication between them via memo? Uh, yes, there are a lot of memos back and forth. Uh, the judges uh, generally outside of conference, that's how they will communicate. There is at times where they'll just get on the phone together, but generally you 
open up a Word document, you say, thank you so much for your well-reasoned and thoughtful letter. Here are 11 reasons I disagree. <laughs> um, and uh, and through that process, the, the judges on the panel are able to either sway another judge to their side who was maybe on the fence or was inclined to vote the other direction, uh, or it defines uh, things down so you know when you're writing your opinion and the dissent what the issues are. And then the opinion and dissent writing process is also very collaborative. You share drafts back and forth, um, and you're able to respond sometimes through several rounds uh, before you get to a final product. Uh, and it, it, it's a very collegial process, uh, but there is uh, a lot of memos back and forth that the, the clerks will help write. Right. And the district court judge just decides. Yes. Uh, I, you're, at the end of the day, you're the, the king when you're on the district court and the appellate court can do something to change that down the road. But for that day, you're the final word. And so there is uh, there is a nice side to being able to just make a decision and move on. Um, Nicole, maybe you can answer this. We're because uh, there's so many different styles with the judge with the different judges. You know, how much of a role does the clerk play in having influence over the outcome? You know, it does does the judge really seek the clerk's views, or is the clerk just executing a a, a task? Um, I think I think it just depends on the judge. I mean, I hear that for most judges, the clerk has a huge role on the outcome, but it depends like what type of like I don't know. In trials, my judge kind of really just has his own sense of what he's going to do and he wants input of course but um yeah on you know when drafting the formal orders uh you do have a huge input because um of course like you know for me like my co-clerks would review the brief and obviously the judge does and um the judge would want to talk through any issues he might have questions on. Um, but um, yeah, you're you're the one drafting the order. So that's a pretty big role. I can remember um, sitting down with my judges and kind of working through issues together. And it wasn't as if the judge, you know, was was seeking, you know, my view on exactly what the outcome should be. But like in the process of that discussion, you kind of organically have some influence on how the judge comes to see the case. I don't know if you all have similar or different experiences. I think you absolutely do have influence. I mean, your your job is to sort of understand and synthesize and present the legal issues. And so in doing that, you're going to um, usually have an idea of what uh, you think the, the right answer is. Obviously, it's the judge's decision at the end of the day, but, um, you know, you're there because the judge wants you to um, really research the issues and, and have a strong opinion. Um, obviously, there are some cases where it's harder to do that. There needs to be more discussion, but yeah, you should absolutely be prepared to um, be able to say how you think something should be decided and you're going to, that will influence the judge for sure. Um, Kieran, can you kind of tell us what the what the day to day is like clerking for a magistrate? Sure. Uh, so at the end of the day, it is still driven by output, by writing, and getting things off the six month list. Um, but magistrate chambers, I think, all uh, tend to be really high volume. So it's a lot of cases that you, as the clerk, oversee. Uh, the way we were divided was there was an even clerk and an odd clerk, each overseeing 150 plus cases. Um, and magistrate judges get their responsibility in cases either by uh, consent of the parties for all matters or by reference from the district judges. So the one thing that's kind of unpredictable and exciting about it is uh, you might have, or your judge might have no role in a matter. And then you'll see that a new order of reference hits the docket, and now you're overseeing 
general pretrial discovery disputes or drafting uh, report and recommendation on the dispositive motion. Uh, so it is a very fluid uh, clerkship where the things that are on your six month are subject to change. Things can get added sometimes without a ton of notice. Um, so some flexibility is good. Um, but day to day, I think the one difference, uh, or maybe it's not even that different, but there are a lot of conferences, uh, which is great. It, as a clerk, it allows you to really get in uh, the weeds on issues, uh, often on discovery disputes, you know, privilege invocations, also settlement conferences. Although I think you know different chambers do settlement conferences differently. They can just be so time consuming that you know, maybe it's not the best use of your time as a clerk to sit in on, you know, hours of discussions. Um, but so you have all these responsibilities on top of just writing. Uh, and I think the real, the challenge in the clerkship is being able to do all of those responsibilities successfully while also having enough time to write every day. Yeah, that's very true. I actually wrote you made me remember that it was it was hard to find the time to write the opinions sometimes um which brings me to trials um did by show of hands how many of you guys worked on a trial during your clerkship right so it's not everybody um uh you know sometimes you know people will go into a district court clerkship with the expectation that they're certainly going to get a trial and it does not always happen. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. Um, how many of the trials were civil? Like, did anyone clerk on a civil trial? Uh, okay, so a couple people did. All right, so maybe you guys can sort of tell us what is the clerk's role in a trial and how does it impact, you know, your work? Um, we, for my judge, all of the clerks went to every trial hearing, every court appearance. Um, I know some courts or some judges, the only the clerk assigned to that case will go up unless the others want to go to court for that. But we all went to everything. So it didn't really matter if it was your trial. Um, it was going to impact your workflow quite a bit because you can't really work on um, your other cases while you're at trial. You can bring papers with you to read maybe, but in general, it's going to slow you down between nine o'clock and five o'clock uh, during the day, just being there. And then you have the added uh, notes. So our judge would write on a piece of paper, you would hear it hit the top of the bench. Um, and you would, if you were on that case, you'd run up there and look at it. It would say, uh, in, you know, this situation, does hearsay apply? Is there an exception? And so you would run down, get on Westlaw, um, come back 30 minutes later uh, with a, a scribbled response. And so um, you would do that back and forth. Uh, and then at night, you would try and catch up on your cases or if you're not ruling on a motion for the trial. Yeah, Joseph, was was your experience similar? I tend to remember it just being an immense amount of really time sensitive work. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, that was, uh, but but that was actually one of my favorite parts of the clerkship was was exactly what Joshua was describing the the kind of on the spot evidentiary decisions the judge has to make. Um, you know, with Judge Stein, it was it was a little a little bit, a little bit of a hybrid where you know the clerk assigned was, you know, had the primary responsibility for the matter and attended every court appearance. Other clerks would um, attend when they could, um, but when there were other clerks involved and there was an evidentiary issue, everyone was involved in the in, in, in the discussion and the research and in the huddle, so to speak. Um, but it, it was an incredible experience because there's just... I mean, if you like trials, and that's one of the things that interests you about a district court clerkship. Um, so, and I, I agree with what John said that, you know, it's not a guarantee. Maybe one of the things, if you're looking um, at different judges and, and you're speaking to former clerks, as we were discussing earlier, one of the questions you might um, want to ask them is, is does the does the judge typically prioritize getting trials, giving, you know, uh, that there are some judges that request trials um, and they take 
trials um, from other judges if they're too overloaded they look to do that um, so that's a question that you might want to ask uh, former clerks but um, it was a great experience my trial was like a a trial in Pittsburgh sometimes you're lucky with a judge sits by designation in some other district so we went to Pittsburgh and did a, a 1983 trial it was very interesting um, highly recommend getting that experience if you can Nicole, you you had multiple trials when you clerked, is that right? Yeah, um, we were working through the backlog that built up from COVID. So um, I, I just don't even remember how many, it was like five or more trials. And very unique. That's a very unique experience. People shouldn't expect that, but I, I'm definitely interested to hear what the experience was like and how it affected your, your clerkship and what you came away with from that. Um, I mean, it was great experience for, you know, the reasons, um, you know, Josh and Joe have explained already. It's it's kind of a lot of fun to decide all those issues on the spot, um, and, you know, do some emergency Westlawing. And uh, uh, I mean, drafting the jury instructions is right. a really cool experience. Um, it was nice to have the opportunity to do that just more than once and you know see how that whole process works um it was very interesting to observe a jury so many times um and just i liked to sort of yeah i like to guess like what how they were going to come out and stuff it was um just incredibly interesting yeah yeah now before we go to like you know big picture takeaways best part of the job most challenging part of the job and the like I want to ask about one other issue that chambers vary on. And this is actually something for applicants to consider and maybe even ask the judge and the clerks about during the interview process, which is interacting with the with the parties. Some chambers will allow parties to call chambers and speak with a clerk, um, sometimes even about something substantive. Um, whereas other chambers, uh, don't really allow the clerks to speak with the parties because they don't want the parties to say, oh, your clerk told me I could do this when maybe the clerk didn't or there was a misunderstanding. Um, in your various clerkships, were you, you know, interacting regularly with, with parties or not? And Kieran, I'll start with you from the magistrate judge side. I think, like you said, it, it really is judge by judge specific, but uh, the judge's rules are pretty clear that, you know, any kind of ex parte contacts are supposed to be minimized. The one exception where it does come up in sort of a non-substantive way is magistrate judges do do settlement conferences, and that entails some degree of informality and, you know, candor off the record between the judge and the parties. And, and as part of that, the parties need to submit settlement submissions. So there is some limited, uh, you know, contact in that way, but as a clerk, no, there absolutely were never substantive conversations with the parties that's prohibited. Right, and and I know that Judge, I, I think it's Judge Rakoff who has his clerks talk to the parties about discovery issues. Like they'll get on and they'll present their differing views on the discovery dispute to the clerk. And then the clerk will go talk to the judge and come back with an answer. Um, but I never had an experience like that. And I don't know if, if any of you guys had substantive interactions with parties like that. Ever yeah. any... Oh, oh sorry, go ahead, Dan. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say never never substantive. I mean, parties call chambers a lot, um, especially in criminal cases, you know, the, the, the US attorneys are sort of repeat players and will right. call, but, you know, it's a lot of, you know, the, there was a docket bounce that the the status conference was canceled. Are we back on for tomorrow? Or a civil party saying, you know, our our time to answer is up in three days, but we're submitting our pre motion conference letter. Do we still have to um, move to push the date back, or can we just file the letter? And those sort of housekeeping type issues, but but definitely not, nothing substantive um, would be discussed. Right. Dan, what were you going to say? I was going to say nothing substantive, but really 
you know, your judges like sealing rules and the whole sealing process because you're going to get panic calls from, uh, you know, counsel about sealing at the 11th hour. Um, that, you know, is very helpful in pushing that along in a not substantive, you know, just technical way and right. the best practices for your judge. So I would love to hear all your thoughts on the best part of the job and the most challenging part of the job as we kind of come toward the end. Um, Dan, why don't you you go ahead? Oh, <laughs> I think the best part of the job is just how much you're exposed to and like, you know, having been in private practice a bit now and what goes into any sort of memorandum, any any real, you know, summary judgment or you know, suppression motion. Um, and as a clerk, you, you get to consume all of that after all, of, you know, that intense work's been done. Um, and, and you just, you learn a, a ton just about a lot of things and, um, you know, I I was looking up an an old case from uh, you know my Indiana clerkship today to write a, um, a expert uh, witness declaration and I was like wait I remember that case like had a good one um, and like going on the docket and finding it so like it just helps your repository uh, I think the most challenging thing is on that same ilk and you know if you have uh, like an active status judge. Um, you know, just the volume and what you're churning out and, and the district court clerks, it could just, it's a lot, you know, and, and, and you really, it, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's challenging, but, you know, it's a skill that you get out of it and being disciplined and being able to write quickly and being able to make use of briefs. And, um, you know, that's what it, I would say is the most challenging part of it too. Joseph, what are your thoughts on this? Best part, most challenging part? Sure. Um, I mean, it, what Dan said, the breadth of, of, of what you uh, get to work on. And then you learn not just different subject matters, you also just learn more about like litigation itself and get to hone your writing and research. And I think I saw one of the Q&A questions, how do, you, how do you write faster and more efficiently in yeah. practice? And you just get to, do, that's what's great about the clerkship is you get to do more of those and then you get to to to, to do it well. Um, but maybe the most fulfilling part is, I mean, I was, I was reminded, uh, I remembered a story when, when you guys were talking about whether a clerk has influence with the, you know, with the judge. I remember there was an oral argument in, in some civil case that we had and the attorney who was arguing for one of the parties did this kind of bizarre thing where most of the argument, he was looking at the clerk, me, as opposed to the judge when making the argument. Um, definitely do not recommend doing that. That did not <laughs> go over well at all. Um, but there's a reason, at least in the clerk's, I mean, in the attorney's own misguided thinking, there was a reason he did that. It's because he recognized that the, the clerk really, you know, is the one who's closest to the research, et cetera, and does have a say, you know, and, and, and influence in, in in the outcome and that's a pretty you know heavy thing and, and not an experience that a young attorney usually has coming into a clerkship so um it's something to to cherish i guess and also it's you know recognize that it's a big deal um and so you know what you do matters how about you nicole thoughts on best part most challenging part um i think the best part is just you get, I, I at least spent all my time um, researching and writing and it's kind of a real luxury. You just learn so much and um, you become, I became like a much better writer from that and getting feedback from the judge and the career clerk um, working through those issues was also just invaluable. Um, and the most challenging part, um, probably just knowing what an important job it is was never lost on me and just how important the court's role is generally. And I always really, really wanted to, to get everything right. And um, that's a real responsibility. Anyone else? Joshua, maybe? Uh, yeah, I. the best part for me was the proximity to these just great people, both in 
an academic sense, um, they're great legal minds, but also Judge Kodal and Judge Bianco are two of my favorite people in the world. So just getting to be around them, talk through these issues, uh, hope that a little bit of it rubs off on you um, and that you can, through osmosis, uh, kind of take that on is, is definitely the most rewarding part, uh, I think, for me. Uh, on the district court, the toughest part were, I think, the hours, actually, and you should ask this about your judges when you interview. Um, Judge Kodal, we were all in chambers with him from 9.30 in the morning until 9, 10 at night, uh, Monday to Friday, and we went out on Saturdays from 3 to 9.30. Uh, so it's, it's not a schedule that um, I even do in private practice now. So it's, it's something that's tough and you should ask about before because not everyone's the same. Um, that's pretty intense. Yeah, one yeah. disclaimer for the people listening is that not all clerkships have those hours. No, I, <laughs> I think it's very, uh, very different. And on the appellate court, court with Judge Bianco, we uh, didn't nearly have those hours. Um, I think the, the toughest part on the appellate court was missing the action of uh, being in court every day in the, the district court, it, it definitely still has rewarding experiences, but uh, you kind of never get over getting to go into the, the district court every day and hear arguments or see the trials. Yeah. And on, on that point, I'd add one thing that you might not kind of uh, perceive as like important when you're applying, um, but there's a big difference between active judges and judges who are on senior status in terms right. of workload. And I know I didn't really appreciate that um, and when I was applying, but, you know, senior status, the, the judges can choose essentially the cases that they want to take. Um, and so oftentimes they're at a more um, easygoing pace than, than the active judges, but not always. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Um, Kieran and Nico, anything to add on that's part, most challenging part? I mean, I would echo a lot of what everyone said, certainly like what Joshua said, just being able to learn from such a brilliant person and seeing how judges make decisions. There's nowhere else you can get that experience. For me personally, just like developing the versatility of being immersed in so many different subject matters that that was totally new to me since I came from a particular practice area. So it allowed me to really grow as an attorney, like in a way that I don't think I could have done without clerking. Uh, so that was amazing, and I don't think you can find that elsewhere. Um, as Nicole said, in terms of the challenges, I think it is such a weighty responsibility that you have. Uh, in, in effect, you can never be wrong. You have to, your drafts that you write, you have to strive to never make an error. Uh, so that's a lot of pressure. Uh, and when you add the time demands, um, where you can't spend as much time as you necessarily would want to on any given thing because there's so many other things. Uh, it's just, it's a balance. Uh, so I think that's the challenge. Yeah. Yeah, I think everyone's covered it. I would just stress or, or emphasize that for, you know, for this year, there's just a special bond with the judge and your co-clerk. So, so yes to the getting better as a writer or learning as a lawyer, but really just as a sort of life experience, it's incredibly unique. And I think that was the best part. I think the worst part was in my second week issuing a text order in this really long running antitrust case. And so when you get to submit, the list of lawyers was like 47 long. And I probably stared at that button for like an hour. <laughs> so that, was, that was the hardest part. I, um, I would add, I would add one thing um, to the best parts, which is I got this, like these lifelong relationships, you know, with the judges I clerked for, which is wonderful. And with the clerks that I co-clerked with, I mean, there's like, yeah, and even others who I met through the network of clerks for those judges, those are great personal relationships and professional relationships because um, the clerks that you, you clerk with, you know, many of them go on to have great legal careers of their own and it, it's good to it's good to stay in touch um i do agree about the weighty part it is a it is a weighty responsibility and i never felt worse than when i uh i was the clerk who drafted an opinion on a case um in the second circuit and we uh you know the, the panel agreed with it and but then it went up to the supreme court and we got we got reversed nine nothing so that was uh 
That was a terrible feeling. Although we did accomplish the impossible and unite the Supreme Court unanimously around something. Um, so uh, um, I guess, you know, kind of the last the thing I would ask before we turn to the one or two questions from the audience is, um, did you guys learn anything valuable about lawyering for your own career through your observations? Uh, in your clerkships and and if you did, are there any kind of like practice takeaways that stand out in your mind? I think it's just the the keeping in mind, uh, you know, if you're you're litigating and you're you're submitting papers, you're communicating with the court that there 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 is this person that the information most likely um, is going through, and so just thinking about keeping that in mind thinking about, you know, what, what are the things that I would sort of like to see when I was clerking? Um, but just sort of having that in sort of that realism in your, in your mind, when you're sort of discussing strategy or figuring out what to do. Yeah. For me, it was credibility. It was like very important to maintain credibility. Um, if you lose that, you're kind of done, you know, um, I think for me, it was the good lawyers knew what was important and to focus on that. You kind of go cross-eyed with seven different arguments in a brief. And so you're trying to work on all of them, but the really good ones knew which points to hammer and uh, and really make sure they spoon fed uh, an order to you. So I think that those were the, the good ones. Yeah. And I would add to the trial observation you get if you get that opportunity um, is just extraordinary and as you know I, somebody who's a litigator um, you know we don't end up in court often um, and so when thinking about how to frame or how to do something I often think back to watching those trials during my clerkship or those oral arguments um, as that first touch of you yeah, know, how do I want to do this? Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat I just want to briefly turn to. One is, what are your average weekly work hours as law clerks? I think that um, my experience was not like Joshua's. I'd say on the district court, I was probably working around 50 hours a week. Um, on the appellate level, it was probably a approximately the same, maybe a bit less. Um, so mine were, my hours weren't like crazy, I would say. They were solid, but not crazy. I don't know what were your guys' experiences generally. In line with that? I think there's a seasonality to it. I, right. I never actually counted the hours. I mean, there were times where it was certainly very busy. Um, but around when motions were due, things inevitably got very, very busy. Um, but on the, you know, the flip side of that is after those deadlines, things do get a little bit more open and a little quieter briefly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've also been asked about any advice on how to draft opinions faster and more efficiently. This one, I would have to agree with Joseph on. You just, you just do it. I don't know if anybody else has anything to add. I know it's not, but it's one of those things you just kind of learn by doing. Um, yeah. And some of them are just so hard that it, you can't be super efficient or fast at it, you know. Um, and the last question is, how do you recommend approaching professor recommenders about making a call on your behalf, particularly if you're casting a wide net in applications? Um, my advice would be, you have to do it judiciously. You know, you can only ask them to make one call, I suppose. Um, so it should probably be with someone who you've had a good um, conversation with in the interview. Does anybody else have any, any other advice on that? I think different professors go about it differently. I know some professors, you know, said, give me one name or give me five. Um, so I, I sort of go professor by professor um, and also have them call even like when you've applied before you've gotten an interview, not just wait until you've had an interview. Um, 
but I'd also say just don't be shy about asking professors like this this is a they know that that's a part of their job um so I would just do it um even if it's awkward just ask them because they know that you know this is something that they do and you know be respectful and obviously don't say you know you have to make 33 calls for me but if there are one or two that you think would be useful definitely don't be shy right I think just generally with professors, one helpful uh, bit of advice that I got was to be open with the professor you're approaching about how you're applying, what your kind of narrative is, what judges you're targeting, and where you see that professor's recommendation fitting in that picture. Uh, and I think it makes it really helpful for them, certainly, you know, if they have so many law students that they've taught over the years, to remind them of who you were. Uh, and what their role was in your legal education. And then also where, you know, potentially assuming their views of you are in line with it, what they can kind of emphasize in either making a call or putting together a letter. Yeah. There's actually a couple more late breaking questions in the chat, which I will address. One is, did you get a better sense of what kind of practice you wanted to have after clerking? Did your plan change much as a result of your clerkship? So for me, I definitely did. Um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I got to clerk on some class action cases, some securities cases, and I was just totally fascinated by them. And that really helped me understand that I'd be happy doing that work and I wanted to do that work. And I came to the firm that I'm at now in significant part because of, of the sort of self-reflection and learning I was able to do about that during the clerkships. I noticed that Many of you are working in white collar now, uh, and I'm wondering if your clerkships had any role in that. Definitely. I, I think that being in the courtroom is addicting, and uh, white collar is one of the better ways as a private uh, attorney to, to get back into the courtroom and litigate or maybe even get into trial work. Um, there are definitely others, but it, it's a good one. And so I think that's why you see so many law clerks going into white collar work. It's true. The white collar stuff does go to trial at a higher rate. Yeah. 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 Um, so we're, we have a question of, for those who worked at law firms prior to clerking, how long should you work? I know Joseph's answer, one year, exactly. Um, I think, you know, you know, a one to maybe two, three. Joshua, it was two at Scadden, is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was two. Right now, I mean, for some courts, you're not really going to have a choice. They're hiring four or five years out. So you're essentially an eighth grader when you're interviewing. Right. Um, but uh, I think a lot of judges have switched to hiring people in law school, but to have them start a year or two after you're out, which is probably what I would advise uh, if if I were talking to someone about that. Okay. Yeah, just to add, you know, my start dates for my clerkship, I, you know, were, were dictated by my judge um, and more my judges, I should say, and not by uh, me. So it was just kind of, you know, I keep interviewing, keep interviewing, okay, now I get an offer, now here's the start date. So it was, you know, way more mechanical than, um, you know, choice. Right. And the last question is, are there any types of cases we should avoid taking or political activities that should be avoided in the period between when we've accepted the clerkship and actually started the clerkship? And that one, and please let me know if any of you disagree, I would say that's something you should talk to the judges chambers about and make, you know, see if the judge has any rules or even preferences about it and just follow them. Um, well, thank you all so much for sharing your insights and your experiences and your time with us uh, on behalf of the Federal Bar Council. We really appreciate it. Um, thanks again and, and have a wonderful rest of the evening. Yeah, thanks a lot, John. Thanks, John. All right, take care, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, John. Bye-bye.